Thank you for listening to Take Two Plus, the only podcast on the internet now suspected in the Hoffa murders. Just want to uh, take a second and address what's happening here. I'm not sure if it was you, Karen. Doesn't matter, but let me be clear. I guess it was our Irishman podcast that gave us away a long time ago. I think she's been talking to the FBI about us. She's a I always knew there was something wrong with Karen. Yeah. She's banned. She's like listening to take too close. <laughs> yeah, I always that brings our I listener count to zero. Yeah. <laughs> the following may contain harsh language, poorly communicated ideas, and does not reflect the opinions of iHeartRadio. This week's episode is brought to you by a very special company, a company that uh, I can actually vouch for personally, and this is the uh, Domestic Monument Company. Uh, what happens is they create lifelike cement sculptures of your, uh, say, just cherished pet of something, dog, cat, and uh, what they do is they fill the animal with cement so that when it hardens and expands, goodbye skin and guts, Hello, Domestic Monument. It's a concrete statue designed by concrete experts trained for about two weekends on how to keep your family solid as a rock. Join us as we look at the good, the bad, and the ugly of the movies while uncovering the sexy and, ooh, sometimes slutty secrets of your favorite celebrities. My name's Chris. I'm Sean. And I'm Tyler. This week, we looked at first movie, third round pick for Tyler in our new 2020 Corona Revenge movie draft. I can't actually even pronounce this name. So Tyler, what movie did we watch this week? I'll give you the uh, white man pronunciation, which Thank is you. Harry Carey. I just think they stand down and tired. stand by, Jacob. We have one of the Take Two Plus dancers. Oh, oh we got groupies <laughs> already, Chris. Thank you. You're sweet. I had Thank no you. idea. All right. Uh, Tyler, why don't you get into discussing how this episode's going to work again, like you always do? All right. So the rules of the game are: last week we launched this revenge series by each picking our top three films that fit the category. We'll now discuss one of them a week to determine our top nine revenge movies ranked in order. We then tally up points based on standings, which means if your films end up in one, two, and three, you get a total score of six for all You're our mathematicians out there. If I my first three picks, uh, I was landing. hoping so much this joke was dead. No, this joke ah! is just getting started. I'm trying to figure this out. I never actually understood it during the Hitchcock draft, so right, I just want to make sure I get it. Chris. Yeah. So how bad do you have to be in this game to get a score of 17, uh, Tyler? <laughs> get a score I of 17. I think you and I both know the answer to that yeah. question, Chris. <laughs> Refer to our previous 11 uh, podcast episodes, you know. But once we tally up all those points, the lowest score will win, which means it's in your best interest to highlight what makes your pick so great while emphasizing why someone else's choice might not be so good. This week so you're is saying, <laughs> God, it's so funny. Okay, here we go. Have a kiki. <laughs> oh, gonna, God. Yeah, let's do, no. I love I'm that gonna, song. They sing it all the time, and it's so catchy. I'm, I'm going to do a disclaimer on behalf of all of us right now for the like terrible pronunciation that you're about to hear over the next 40 minutes or so. I'm so going to actually try. try. No one else is going to try. And I'm going to really laugh at him trying, so you may have to edit that out. This is my uh, third round pick. It's a 1962 Japanese film, Harry Kiri, directed by Masaki Kobayashi. John, give us a synopsis. Harakiri? Okay. Harakiri! So <laughs> when peace breaks out in Japan in the 17th century, thousands of samurai find themselves without a clan, out of work, and in poverty. When such a fate befalls a samurai, many choose to commit ritual suicide, otherwise known as Harakiri. Ritualistic, self-inflicted disembowelment. In this story, an elder samurai named Hanshiro Sugomo, played by Tatsuya Nakati, oh. seeks admittance to the house of a feudal nice. lord so he can commit the act. Once there, he learns of the fate of his son-in-law, a young samurai who had previously sought work at this house, only to instead have been forced to commit halakiri in an excruci uh, excruciating manner with a dull blade made of bamboo. This, oh, revelation, <laughs> this revelation sets in motion a tense showdown between the elder samurai and the house as the former extracts revenge on the ladder. This is a beautiful um, movie, by the way. I haven't seen this before. This is a beautiful yeah. movie. I'm not sure how you what you call it. Um, <laughs> how to kitty. I was like, how are the subtitles going for? And you're like, this movie has subtitles? Yeah. <laughs> and then you're like, yeah, you're not watching the right movie, bud. Yeah. yeah. So actually, it took me a little, it took me a take two plus uh, to turn off uh, the Hunger Games, uh, Catching Fire, and turn on Haraka. Okay, why don't we go into some bits and pieces for this movie before we get into what we feel about it. Directed by Masaki hey. Kobayashi. 
an artist who liked to turn a critical eye towards the human mm. condition. He even made an entire trilogy of films that look at exactly that and is called, appropriately enough, the Human Condition series. Now, these are like three three hour movies, like nine hours total. I just added them to my list today. We'll see how they are eventually. I've never seen them. All right, so the film was written by the uh, same writer as uh, Akira Kurosawa used for the films Rashomon and Seven Samurai and Throne of Blood. His name is Shinobu Kashimoto. He came up with the idea of looking uh, at the day of the life of a samurai when he was writing Seven Samurai for Kurosawa. And that was kind of like the genesis of this film. He wanted to look at the day of the life of a samurai. But then he found the short story that the, the actual film Harakiri, Harakiri is based off of. And then he kind of adapted his original idea to help it fit into the story. Uh, Kurosawa sword fights usually come across uh, like an art form, if you've ever seen a, an Akira Kurosawa film. They're like very graceful and beautiful. Kobayashi in this film, he makes his, uh, his battles more grimy and realistic. For instance, at the same time that this film uh, was shooting, both Yojimbo and Sanjuro, which are Akira Kurosawa's samurai pictures, they were filming around the same time. And if you were to watch those films and put them up against this one, they're just completely different experiences, tonally and just in how they look. Uh, Kurosawa is much more of, I guess, you, I mean, he wasn't really a popcorn filmmaker, but compared to what this film is, he was definitely much more. He like was that. probably the most like popular Japanese filmmaker. I have a legitimate time, question. Right? When it comes yeah. to these samurai movies, are they all taking place like with it within a certain period of time, like historically, or is it like a, the, yeah. the Wild West, like a Western that pretty much takes like what nineteenth century kind of thing? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, samurai... I don't know it as well. Seventeenth century. Like, I... I think yeah, this it's... film is somewhat early. Like, I think, uh, like, I would say, like, 1600s to, like, maybe the end of the 70s. But is that what, like, Seven Samurai is and all these, like, Akira Kurosawa ninja, uh, ninja movies? Like, They're roughly set in the 1600s. I would say this film takes place at, weird, the end, eh? at the end of the 17th century, which is when the samurai were dying out, so. Yeah, it's 1630 in this movie, right? It, yeah, I think so. It century. must be exciting, though, because uh, up until then, it would have just been, like, tradition to probably, like, pass on these stories, like, orally, mm -hmm. oral sex-wise. And Well, uh, that's why Japanese uh, films, I mean, samurai <laughs> films were always huge in Japan, right? Yeah. Uh, no, but, but the I mean, more so you watch... see it on stage, and guess what? Here's something that I found very interesting about this film. So beautifully shot. It's so such a well, pleasure to look at. let's get into that in a minute. Let's get into it. No, but let me just ask you this. Like? Isn't it interesting that Asian cinema in the early 60s and American cinema were very similar, even though the content of what they have to offer is so completely different, but like the way they communicate it visually? Visually um, an aesthetic? Yeah, I mean, there's a certain, mm -hmm. like, I would argue that in like the 60s, 50s, maybe a little bit, mostly the 60s, like cinema, in a, in a universal sense, started to use the same language a lot more than they had prior to that. Like films were very much a distinct thing before the 60s, but once French New Wave came in and once French art, uh, critics started promoting people like Alfred Hitchcock and other critics, like everyone started using the same language a lot more. And so I think that movies started to like, reflect other uh, other cultures. Like cultures, yeah. So uh, would Kobayashi be influenced by Hitchcock? Uh, or Take I, I Two Plus? Yeah, probably take two plus. Probably take two plus, yeah. But Hitchcock, probably to a degree, not like huge like in, they are in Europe. I don't think like it was quite as big as it was in Europe in terms of North American cinema. But from, I, I'm sure he knew of them. I'm sure. From the reading I've done on this film and just other like Akira Kurosawa movies and other Japanese films, like a lot of the big name directors started as assistants under other working directors in Japan. Right. So I think a lot of their influence was internal, just by the fact of like being mentored by people and then going on to make their own films. Not to say they didn't watch Hitchcock or whatever else outside of uh, Asia. Like the movie. States, like, they had the like, built within a studio system within yeah. Japan. Was one like, of those like things the though, where there was as many system. films coming out or were there fewer films, but they were just all much, like, much more solid films? No, they, they had a huge pipeline. Kind of films in Japan, yeah. like that. They had a huge pipeline. No, they had a huge, like they had a huge, like they made a ton of content. And okay. like they, like I said, it's like, it's very much like the American studio system. Like I would say like the Japanese studio system lasted longer than even the American studio system, at least like later into the decade. And the other thing, I mean, going back, I guess, talking about this film as a samurai picture, in, a, in reality, this film is more of an anti-samurai picture. It's a subversion of the typical enjoyment that Japanese audiences would get from seeing a samurai uh, film like they're used to, like Akira Kurosawa. Uh, this film really has no action in it at all until like the final 30 minutes. And while that I final that. duel, which we'll get to, I think, I mean, I don't really want to talk about it right now either, but like that no, is- No, like, I think we should talk about it. Okay, ever. here's the thing about the duel. <laughs> <laughs> So the whole idea behind, uh, there's a couple different words for, for what harakiri is, right? There's like, J Japan has two different words. They have harakiri and they have sopoku. Uh, sopoku is like the more usual, the more used word for what harakiri is. Harakiri is like the more vulgar word. 
Um, but it's basically a form of atonement for a, uh, for a samurai as he dies. He's both punishing himself for his failings while atoning at the same time for them by Versus. taking his own life. So it's a very it's a very important aspect of this culture, especially in this time, right in the 17th century. So it's an interesting idea because it's also a very aggressive idea that in the 60s, you know, we've never been explored before at this point. Can I ask you one this, question though, when it comes to this movie what? and the idea of this uh, harakiki or whatever? Harakiri. Uh, harakiri. Like it's easy for me to say now. I have to correct all you motherfuckers so much. It's harakiri. <sighs> well, that's because you're so smart, Sean. We're so stupid. I know. I know. So what's going on with the extortion of Haraki, uh, Harakiri? You know what I mean? Like that's a big thing, and it's like, oh, you are extorting us. Uh, well, a lot about this film is, I think it's, it's to me again. I don't want to get into this quite yet, but since you're bringing it up, Chris, I think that this film deals. The people a lot need with, to know, Sean. Like the Japanese culture and the histor and the history of the Japanese culture and how things used to work back then, and I think it uses revenge as like a mechanic to like let us see that. But Harakiri was a very important part of Japanese culture. What was your question again? Oh, the, uh, the yeah, you're not even anti. Yeah, okay. Oh, okay. No, John, no. Let me okay. Just... You're saying what? So what they're talking? But like, fuck. Like, you have Harakiri, right? And so these samurais would show up at different houses, like the Lee clan, and say they're going to kill themselves, hoping in reality, because they're poor and broke, that this ho this house will just give them a little bit of food, give them a little bit of money, and send them on their way. But in Japanese culture, that's very disgraceful for certain people who like take their morals and their like culture very seriously. And in Japan, that's a huge segment of the population. Then why so, is it like, a thing then? And they will they if imply in this movie that if you're putting your feet to the fire, then like that's not a very popular thing to be like trying to make an extra buck. It's like, <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna like commit suicide, and I'm like, it's like what? I don't understand your, your problem. They're implying in this movie, well, not even implying, they say already in this movie that other clans have done this. Like, they've stopped guys from committing ritual suicide and given them jobs instead and yeah. giving them money. In the story of Chijiwa, that's what he wanted to happen, right? That's what he went to do. He thought that because he had heard it happen to other samurai, that if he went to this house and he just said that he was going to commit Harakiri, they might just give him a little bit of food and a little bit of money, which is what he needed to help his son and send him along his way. But that's not how it turned out. That's like Russian roulette, man. Yeah, it definitely. It kind of is, yeah. Okay, so a couple more things. The suit of armor that appears throughout the film is basically a metaphor for the movie. It symbolizes the power and majesty of the past, but it is ultimately empty. So how powerful can it really be? Yet, at the beginning of the film, it's the first thing we see, and at the end of the film, it's the last thing we see. It's a very important metaphor for what this movie is because it shows that even though you can stand up against you know, history and against these clans and against oppression, and you can bring it down like like uh, Sugo does by knocking the the, uh, the armor down, eventually someone's going to put it back up again. So it doesn't really matter. Which does not make this a very hopeful movie, unfortunately. I'm sorry, what's it's the metaphor? A... Hollow history? Yeah, the M from. We'll, we'll, we'll circle back to it, or you can just listen in the edit again if you want to get back to it, Chris. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the movie was extremely successful in Japan. It won a whole bunch of prizes, even around the world. Uh, critics and audiences loved it. Did it win, did it win the Teen, Teen Choice Award? It did not, <laughs> but when it went to Khan, many people thought it was going to win the uh, Palme d'Or, but it lost to Visconti's The Leopard, which is an awesome movie, so it's hard to judge that. But it did It did pick up the Special Jury Prize. It's nice, isn't special it? Special Jury is what, like a Critics' Choice type of uh, deal? Well, I think it's like the audience. It oh, might be like an audience and award, I think, but I'm not 100%. You might want to double check that. <laughs> it's I, like I a short list, audience. probably. I feel like Special Jury's audience, but it might be critics. I feel like the Ponda Or is probably critics. This is a cool movie because it is a timepiece. People... Wait, I got like three more things. You can say that. In oh my God. Okay, well, why don't you just let everyone know like where you're... I will. When you're done. When I'm done. I love I'm all the pauses, one. Sean, because it just lets me just like, oh, I, can't, I wonder what I'm going to do with all this freaking dead air. Kobayashi, when the director Kobayashi couldn't find a way to get the blocking of the bamboo sepoku uh, harakari scene right, uh, he couldn't figure out the, the way one? to get the yeah, like the, the when the Chijiwa scene, kills when Chijiwa does it, yeah, he with couldn't the band, get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah because gross. it was it, yeah, that's like but, surprisingly yeah, gory. By the way, yeah. did they have the same rating system in Japan as they did in uh, no. America? I doubt it. I, I don't no, know. I don't would even this have been rated because it would have been like PG over here. No. You would have been no, this would, this would have been written mature, I think, over here. Yeah. It's gross. Uh, but, it's very realistic. I was watching it with actually a couple of friends, uh, and one of them pointed out that it uh, is very realistic, kind of. You know, it's like excruciating it's really slow that scene, like deliberately slow. Like, yeah, you really feel... it's torturously slow. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, anyway, he couldn't figure out how to get the blocking of that scene right, but eventually, uh, he decided that he would go home and get extremely drunk 
And that's exactly what he did. Kobayashi, or Kobayashi went home, got extremely drunk, and then realized as he was stumbling all over the place that what Chichiwa needed to do was just simply fall over his sword for him to get the end of the scene right. So that's what he ended up doing. Uh, I'd like to point out also that they steal that in uh, Friday the 13th Part 4, the final chapter. <laughs> the sorry, they steal what? Goes through today. his eye? A bamboo. Remember the the the, the, uh, the machete goes through um, an animatronic Jason's face, to, like through the eye. Oh, and like, like, <laughs> off as is this, it like bamboo? I don't understand the reference. How it pertains okay. to this movie? God, okay, Sean, you're not even giving me <laughs> half an inch. You're not even get... okay. There are certain uh... things that were inspired by this movie. You see, one of them, surprisingly, because it's such a lowbrow film, one of the shittiest movies ever. Probably the Thirteenth <laughs> Part Four, with yeah. fucking uh, what's his face. Corey Feldman. The ending scene features a very similar death, only I would like to think it's a homage. An homage. You know, there's a giant butcher's knife and it's uh, Jason's face, basically. All right. You know, this is all being cut out of the movie or okay. of the uh, podcast. <laughs> yeah, so so like, let me just get the last two points out and then we're, then we're good. Uh, with the release of this film, Kobayashi officially became one of the golden children of the golden age of Japanese filmmaking, along with the likes of Kurosawa, who made Seven Samurai and High and Low, and Yasujiro, Oro, um, sorry, Yasujiro Ozu, who made Tokyo Story, and Kenji Mizuguchi, who made Yugetsu. Apparently, Nakati and the actor who played his nemesis in the film, Rentaro Mukuni, who played uh, Saito, I believe, they did not get along at first at all. So Kobayashi spoke with them and told them that he was going to stop filming until they figured out how to work with one another. And they ended up holding back filming for three days so these guys could figure out their differences. Like they literally shut down filming for three days just so these actors could figure out how they were going to work with one another, which is basically <laughs> just unheard of. Do you think that was legit? Like them figuring it out? Do you think the director just wanted like three days off? <laughs> well, like, see, that's the thing. Because then out. I hear another story saying that that sword duel that he has at the end of the film with one of the three guards at the end the, of the like, film. Final one, yeah, yeah, the like final one? Yeah. I'm in the grass one. or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, that scene, he literally took like a week or something to shoot because he was just waiting for the right clouds. Every day he'd show up on set and he'd be like, nope, clouds aren't right. Not, we're not shooting today. And he was just waiting all that's the time. That's like such a director flex. Like that's like a David Fincher move or something like that. All right, those are my points, bud. Now we can get into what we feel like about this film. Chris, I can't wait. tell us, what do you think about the film Harakiri now that you've seen it for the first time? Uh, well, as you know, Sean, uh, around here at Take Two Plus, we watch it twice. Because the first time we are so blackout drunk, we can't even remember. <laughs> this is a sexy movie, okay? We can all agree on that. It is beautiful. Yeah. It is. Mm -hmm. It is of the highest tier, quality-wise. So, Chris, if there was one thing that stood out to you in this movie, what was it? Like, when you, what was cinematography? Your who, who did the cinematography for this movie, by the way? It is Yoshio Miyajima. Yeah, he it mostly like just he worked did with this guy. Basically, all of uh, Kobayashi's movies. Yeah. One of the things I really liked about this film in terms of just like how it starts, it's just like the opening. I think like the opening shot of the suit of armor, like we're going back to that metaphor again, but it's just mm -hmm. so mysterious and ominous and like the music in the background. It's just like, and there's like that smoke just billowing the smoke, around the yeah. uniform. It's just like, it's such an awesome shot. And then establishing uh, the suit of armor, just sitting there from the very first shot of the film, it gives the ending extra meaning when you rewatch the film the second time, because you know, at the end of the film, the main character destroys the, the suit of armor by throwing it at the, his opponents and like knocking it over. I mean, I guess at the end of the film, you do see it's already put back together, but it's like when you watch the like film- the cover up, right? Yeah, it's a cover up basically. Yeah. When you watch it the first time and then you kind of forget about it for a while, because I've only seen this movie twice and the last time yeah. I watched it was the second time. And then you start the film again for this, uh, like the second time and that's the first thing you see like, oh shit, yeah. He's telling you from the very beginning that everything that happens in the story is pointless. You know, as soon as you see that, that, that suit of armor just standing there and sitting there like, oh, so this story changed nothing. Regardless of what Sigumo does, the clan is going to survive and the samurai is going to survive beyond him yeah. as like a honorable thing. Yeah. Even though they have no honor really by the end of it. Here we are, we're talking about Heineken. This is so exciting. I drank 15 Heinekens because I was so excited to see this movie. I called Heineken and asked if I could get a free copy and they sent me one. So Criterion, I'm not sure if you want to like talk to Heineken, but they're giving a free Criterion uh, Blu-rays of uh, Heineken's okay. movie. If they had gone with the original title of uh, Sipteku, would you have gotten Sapporo beer instead? 
hundred percent. No. Why don't we get into the scene? Why don't we talk about the bamboo disembowelment scene? What did you guys think? How fucking hard was it to sit through that scene? Because I gotta say, as somebody who watches everything there is in the world, even I find it very difficult to sit through this scene when he tries. I wasn't to sure what the fuck himself. was happening at first, and then all the blood started happening. <laughs> it's it's disturbing as shit. Like it, it really is. fucking is. Mm. It really is. I mean, I don't get it moved looks... by anything. And it is this scene, I was like fucking, like I was adjusting myself. I was trying to fucking compose myself because like it's 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 disturbing, man. It looks fucking, t- I do love like it takes him a, a few tries just to even like cut into yeah, his stomach. That's like, what that's, it is. I think like, that's the takeaway. Like, that's three times. That is the takeaway from it is that it doesn't take as quickly as you would think it would. And in fact, that's why they have the second there is to kind of cut off your head. You've, you've, you've performed a deed. Now it's time to have a quick release into the ancestry or whatever. Yeah. The look you're giving me there a little bit, Chris, is I understand it because like the first time I watched this movie, like that scene, it hit a little bit, but it didn't land. And the second time I'm watching that scene, I'm just like, fuck. Well, there's added significance though as to who that character is, is, what it all means. And so when you see it again, you have that perspective. But I think the first time in, for me personally i was a little confused as to the whole ceremonious nature of the suicide thing Mm -hmm. and like what it all means and so he's kind of the introduction to all that Mm -hmm. and again it was a little confusing as to like oh he has a bamboo sword he's trying to extort us and i'm trying to think of like what that all means uh and so i um wasn't sure really what was going on the first time i saw it well do you understand what it means now okay a movie like this right 1962 you have one chance of watching this movie. That's it. Yeah. it well, really, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I know what likely, you mean. Like, yeah, it's, it's, it's not, not a TV, it's not a DVD, often, yeah. there's no VHS. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Like, no, it'll play in your theater and then it's probably not coming back. Yeah. So let me ask you this then. Was the movie, because you saw, Sean, you just mentioned it, the first mm-hmm. time you saw it, it didn't mm-hmm. land, but it was the second time. But would that be a privilege of the time and day where we can watch movies more than once on Take Two Plus, which is just that second viewing where we really dig deep because we've seen it twice. Uh, it's all about the trial, the, the sophistication. And what? I think that entire scene, like that Harakiri scene with Chijiwa, um, it's like this, like, and actually almost the entire film to that point. There's this building sense of tension and dread through the entire first 40 minutes of this movie, and you can feel it. And that scene just caps it off. And it's almost like this, it's like the first 40 minutes of this movie is this like horror film. Horror Tyler, movie. what do you think, man? I actually, uh, we're comparing films in this scene. I saw Psycho as like the big comparison. In a sense, killing off your yeah. character with a Ooh, very yeah. visceral, visceral uh, death scene like 40 minutes into the movie and taking it in a bit of a new direction after that. Yeah, that's true. Unfortunately, the direction this movie takes for about 20 minutes to 30 minutes is a little boring, but... Yeah, uh, that part's a little slow. Um, I mean, you know, we, we can get, can get into that in a second. Like, uh, what else do we guys like? What else do we like? Some stuff that I do love. I, I love the idea of, like, these samurais at the palace being so obsessed with honor that they lose sense of, like, yeah. compassion, like, human decency. Like, to them, it's more honorable to force someone to kill Hey, did you take that from uh, Karate Kid? Uh, wax on, uh, wax uh, off. You know, there's a lot of honor, but not a lot of compassion. Is that actually from Karate Kid? I feel it's like, no mercy. It's like, now he has the commercials with like the Koala Kai, it's like, show mercy. Cobra Kai. Yeah, we're, this is actually just like a segue to Cobra Kai that I'm trying to... I believe this is the prequel to uh Yeah, Karate pretty Kid. much. Yeah. But no, I like the idea that the, the samurai here in living in the palace see forcing someone to kill themselves with a bamboo sword more honorable than like giving him a little bit of money or a job or like helping him out. It's, Let me ask you this oh, though. See, like I didn't get that from the film. I thought like I, from my reading the film is they know it's not. They're like we're going to enjoy this. I mean, I think you it's see what I, mean? I like, think they're the I think they're lying the to themselves like, in a sense. Like I think, yeah. Like, I think they're rationalizing I mean? like, it a little bit under, maybe under the They basically like, you know what? We're bored as shit. You want to kill yourself? Let's watch. Like, well, that's, you know like what? that's basically look, what you look, get. I think they're forcing There's everyone nothing. to there watch no, so that word will no get out objects and around them. That we're not going to give. You, if you come to our house asking for Harry Carey, you're right. There is that element to it. We're going to force you to do it. There is. And I think it's like it's it's both of them for them, right? Like they, they know that's going to happen. They know it's not only going to do this and make them look strong, but guess what? It's going to entertain the shit out of us. And we're going to watch right. this motherfucker do it with a piece of bamboo. Like it's going to be amazing. No, Okay, I guess what I'm saying is I like that their sense of honor is like perverted in a samurai film that generally like honors such a 
heavy portion of samurai films. All right. Sean, can you uh, tell Tyler what to do, please? <laughs> Tyler, why don't you tell us about what we might not have liked about this film? Why don't we All start right. with a few little things? Huh? So, what, are th- what are a few things that for you, objectively? I mean, I think there's a reason for it and it's part of the pacing, but the stuff with Chijiwa's wife and son is definitely the slowest parts of the film. I guess it would I think be we can even broaden that up a bit and just say, act. and say flashback. You know what I mean? Like in a storytelling yeah, sense, some of the you never want to use flashbacks. Yeah, flashbacks. And yet this, it, it, that was, this yeah. film is comprised of them. Yeah, like, it is it's almost completely not even comprised of them. the part I think is, that is poor the, storytelling. It's it's a it's not it's, it's, a bit it's of not a great storytelling. It's not great. It's not great. Yeah, but at the same time, like the opposite would be to tell it just linearly, and I don't think that's as interesting as a film. Right, right. that's true too. But here's like, and this is what uh, and I can't remember the, the sorry, oh uh, Hashimoto. This is what Hashimoto's argument was, is that as long as the flashback revealed new information to the audience, that it should be, it shouldn't even count as a flashback. It shouldn't matter. It's just propelling the story forward. And I agree with him in that regard, I do. My problem is, is that really a lot of the stuff we see in the flashbacks, especially with his uh, his daughter and uh, Chichiwa as a son-in-law and the child, It's uh, a lot of that could be inferred or suggested and we could yeah. just move this pace along so much faster and really latch on to that first 40 minutes that are just so awesome and amazing yeah. and not have to just like slam on the brakes. The first 40 minutes and the last like 20, 30 minutes of this movie are amazing. Yeah, but, like, I agree those it's first... the weakest part. I think even, well, two, I'll give two things in defense of it that I like. I love the contrast of Sugumo between seeing him like happy with his uh, like new mm-hmm. grandson and newlywed daughter and son-in-law versus when he's but just kind of like you dead could behind just the do eyes. that and then get a taste of it right yeah and you could like... definitely shorten it i'm not saying that but yeah. i'm saying i do like that there's that contrast i like that uh oh. you learn later like an hour into the movie that well chijiwa was being forced to commit ritual suicide his wife and like son were dying at home like that makes that even more heartbreaking than it already is i do like For that. sure the one part i don't really think is needed in the flashbacks at all I mean, it's fine, but you could cut it out. Is the stuff where you learn uh, about Chijiwa's like father and his connection to Sugumo. I don't know if that's that necessary. See, I would argue that you could, to really like shore this up, you could keep that connection and just like the connection between like the, you know, this man, this his brother at arms, and then like yeah. taking it his son once he dies. And yeah. then use that, drop the daughter, drop the baby, just have this connection with this man. I don't know the man, it, but, but having the daughter and the and the son dying in while a sense, he's you can, begging for his life basically in the fortress is so heartbreaking. Like it, it, it adds so much texture to what he's doing there in the first place. Yes, it does make that a little bit more heartbreaking. I give that to you, but you could still get this, this fear of like, you could still play it where he was just going there to try and get some money because he himself was starving or his and his father was starving and he right. was just trying to get some money for them and like you could still get that not maybe quite as hard yeah but, you could but still then you lose all the stuff of, save so much time but then you lose so all the much stuff time. of Chijiwa asking for like one or two days reprieve because you think he's just a coward at the beginning of the film and then you realize oh he actually probably wants to go say goodbye to his family that's but not. you could still no you wouldn't lose that he could still want to go and say goodbye to his father well do you just said to not have the wife and the in the movie at all so you can't but i'm just saying you you anchor the the film on the relationship of this man who raised this child i mean he's basically his son right he is yeah he married well, he him was, off as his, he was, his he's daughter yeah but like you could i'm just saying like if you wanted to make this film i think tighter and and just slightly that much better you would just shore that up by focusing in on yeah. that relationship I'll say, i mean obviously i'm just like i'm just yeah yeah no right i, I like it for the pacing like, and the contrast but i agree if you're going to cut anything from the film it's from mm-hmm that section somewhere yeah. in those flashbacks no, yeah honestly that's really my only my issue with the film the other thing i would say is that just in general neither like the lee clan nor sugomo had a good plan in general in this movie like i don't know what their plans were in this film like the lee clan is just like we know he's probably planning something but let's just see what happens and sugomo right. was like basically i'm just gonna tell these guys my story and then i'm gonna kill them all like i mean what's his plan really like it's it's the, well i think his really plan was also plan. to point out i don't think he necessarily wanted to kill them he wanted to point out the hypocrisy and that he's taking these guys top notch exactly them. but like at the same point he well, tries to take them on he's like and there's a chance like they well yeah he's like, like he, like, he is so those, badass man yeah, yeah. Badass. with those flashbacks of how he takes like the top nuts like you're like he's gonna fucking do this like yeah. he's gonna fucking take this entire yeah, my thing money's on this and then, and then he gets his ass kicked which is amazing <laughs> i think yeah. like he literally gets his ass kicked like he kills four people and like that's it like he yeah. gets his ass handed to him at the end of this movie and like it's tragic it's tragic 
Oh, that's one of the things I liked about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I do sure. love speaking of like the tragedy of it and this is something I like so I'm going back and I apologize but it's just like one very simple line when uh, they try to like call him out thinking like he's not going to commit uh, Sateku there like they're trying to say you know we know guys have tried to do this in the past and he just says he doesn't say he's going to commit Harry Carey but it's like oh I've come here with every intention of that like he basically kind of foreshadows what he's going to do but in a very like roundabout badass way like, don't worry I will die today maybe not how you think but I will die today there's an interview with that actor who talks about the dialect and the tone that he uses in the film and how it's really like uh, almost like kabuki in effect or something, but also how it was something that was like, and he was not used to as somebody coming from theater, but it was like, a, it, it was a stylized effect that had been used before. He, yeah. he kind of talked about it. And he was like a, like a modern actor compared to like the kabuki and no stuff that was more traditional in theater at the time, right? There's lots of different acting forms in Japan. There's so many different like, and they're very strict because in like what they can and cannot do. it seems very different than Western acting style. It is, it is. Yeah. It's, it's more really sharp, different. sharply dramatic. Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, yeah. obviously I think over time that's changed, right? I think modern Japanese films for the most part aren't really like that anymore. Although to be fair, I don't watch a lot of modern Japanese films. Why don't we why don't we talk about where this movie ranks? I think we probably I mean does anyone else have anything they don't like about fucking it? question? Yeah. <laughs> I know it's, it's unfortunate right now. Obviously All right, um, right love the movie. Had a few issues. At the end of the day, I rate it number one. But what do you think? <laughs> like, I, like if you project that into the future, what do you think? Do you think this movie is going to stay at the top, or do you think it's going to fall? Uh, Four or five, yeah. I guess Tyler, what do you think? Like, what do you, how how? Much yeah. power do you think this uh, it's tough. I think Chris Feller is probably going to end up somewhere in the middle of the pack because, like, on the one hand, I think it's a deeper film than some of the other stuff on the list, my own yeah. choices included, and it's more uh, a piece of art, I guess, if you want to say that. Yeah. But then on the other hand, there's films that are a lot more like rewatchable. Like I've definitely seen John Wick more times than I've seen. No, but, Harry, but, but that's the question, though: is 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 how does this stand? Not so much yeah. as, as a revenge. As a revenge as a so, like, so I was gonna say, like, I think this is a first rate film, but how does it stack up? It's a revenge film. And like the more I, I don't think, think it does, film, Tyler. I think the idea Catch of me outside, how about that? a plot device. <laughs> no, I, I kind of agree with Chris. I think revenge is used as kind of a plot point and it's not used as like the theme of this film. The theme is more about history and, and Japanese culture. The theme and, is like, about the, pointing out hypocrisy structure. through revenge, yes, I agree. But if you guys yeah. didn't think it was a revenge movie, you should have vetoed it last week. No, uh, well, no, 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 no. Seen it, I'm not saying it's definitely I was a into your weird. Don't, don't get, don't get tight, Tyler, don't get I'm not getting tight, I'm just get. saying. Yeah, Tyler, that's what they say, don't I'm get tight. I'm just saying, now we are hey. judging these films based on which films we think we like the most for whatever reason, not based on what is the most revenge. Tyler, no matter what happens, you get number one this week, bud. That's no matter true. what happens, hey. I'm hey. just saying. Hey, I'm just I bet you feel like the Zenfo is front correspondent being number one that week. This Fuck might you, last longer than that. This might last longer than that. So. We'll see. Like, I as a I've... revenge film, I What's just next don't movie? know if it's as integral as a... Like, it's more of a plot device than it is, like, a thematic... And, so you're saying like, uh, Tyler is disqualified? No, no, it's not. It's <laughs> but what's wrong with it being a plot element. device instead of being... Uh... I think that. I think having both is the best case scenario. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying you you, you can have movies where it's both, and I don't I think, think having, it is both. It, it. Having a great movie is the best case scenario, regardless of. Uh, well, we'll see. We'll see. So, we'll see. Uh, for all of our listeners, we 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 discussed this, and, and you can uh, check out our um, draft episode. The question was asked: Do we take the top film? Like, are we looking for the best films with revenge in it? Or are we looking for strictly the best revenge films? This is probably the best film with revenge in it, but I would not say it's the best revenge film. No, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. I I don't ultimately think this is even the best film we have on this list. It might be. It might be. And it's also like, in fairness, like this film is. You got to admit, though, Good, the Bad, and the Ugly is more revenge film film. than this. So you guys vetoed that? No, I I don't think you that. Shut the fuck up. I don't agree <laughs> I disagree but, with you on that. But your pick next week, Once Upon a Time in the West, might be, might be. In this film, the victim is, who do you guys say? Who is the victim in this film? To me, it's Tujiwa. The audience. Right? Tujiwa. It's, Tujiwa is the victim in this film. The Avenger is Sugomo, right? That's the, the Avenger in this film. And the target clan, like who is the target of his wrath, is the Lee clan. 
and he only ends up killing four of them. That's just I like think a, it's a, a well. Mistake. I think it starts with the being the first three guys that he takes a top notch from, and then a larger aspect, it's the lead. But he doesn't man. kill those three guys, right? Now they do end up dying because they, they have to commit. Kill themselves. They have to commit Harry Carey, but so he does. He doesn't revenge. kill them. So yeah, but we it's not so much seven. about he's got seven revenge. killed. But I don't think revenge has to be just murder, like revenge. No, 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 I know. I'm just keeping track of this as a running thing for we can right. compare the rest of the movie. Um, right? But what I'm saying he's got is, like I think seven kills. in this film, I think it. He starts with it starts small with the three guys that he takes the top knot from. It's a little bigger when he takes on the whole clan, and then it's even bigger when he's basically take on taking on the entire like system of government and feudalism. Okay, you get, you're getting a little position. metaphorical with that yeah. last one, yeah. but yes, I agree. Well, with you. Is this movie uh, not metaphorical? <laughs> No, you're right. The entire movie is. The other thing I think we should do is always target uh, what does this film say about vengeance? And I think what this film does say about vengeance is that it's justifiable in certain situations, but it's ultimately not that effective in accomplishing anything other than satiating yourself in the moment. Revenge is best served by making a point, i.e. taking the top knots, than it is an eye for an eye, so to speak. I Thank you for not like making that revenge. totally obvious that you're reading it. All right, here's the thing. Wow, Contri- go fuck yourself. Chris, tell us what you think about the revenge in this film. Well, that's just it. I was wondering, I was going to ask you guys, like, is for revenge movies, this one included, like, is revenge quantitative? Like, can we, like, see, oh, this person got more revenge than on this person, I think right? we can look at that. Is it a body count it? or is it like... I'm not saying that it is things or it isn't, but I think that's something we should track and just use as our judgment for when we're... Terminating these things. Yeah, I don't know, yeah. but like I think this film, like the revenge, is specifically not satisfying in this movie intentionally because it gets swept under the rug and they hide everything. You're there. right. It is. It is absolutely. This movie. But that could be tragedy. more profound than something and where it is eye for an eye, where, where he kills never like clean. People. Revenge. Yes, yeah, exactly. clean, right? I agree with you. If this film used revenge as the theme, which it doesn't really, it's really a more of a device, and that's why I think ultimately it doesn't quite accomplish that. It uses. Well, Sean's it as right. A everyone device. else is wrong. Uh, thank you for listening. To Take two plus. <laughs> uh, fuck you. That's not what I think Sean's just introducing body counts because he's got John Wick on his list and he's going to be like, well, it's got the oh, no, body counts, so that it's is, the, clearly no. the best movie. I didn't even think about that until yeah. this moment. He went no, with 1,500 body counts. Like, <laughs> you know, body literally counts the equivalent of like three small towns. Mm-hmm. As I was saying way earlier, I think this film went up somewhere in the middle because it is an exceptional film, but it doesn't necessarily have this rewatchability. Uh, I agree with Tyler. I think that this is a really great movie. It would probably be midway on the list. Like, I mean, it's, it is going to be difficult, I think, uh, moving forward because... Well, for instance, next week's film is Once Upon a Time in the West. Yeah. That's an amazing movie. Yeah, that's a great movie. That's an amazing movie. Is it Does a good it revenge it? movie? That's, it. that's the question, and it's been a yeah. long time since I've watched it, so we'll find out. Yeah, two hours and 45 minutes. We'll see. All right. Well, whatever. Fuck you. Anyway, so uh, thank you for listening to Take Two Plus. Uh, This was the episode on uh, Heineken. Uh, This is the first episode of our Revenge Draft series. Right, everyone? Uh, You'll be ahead of your time. You'll be a fool not to listen to next week. A stupid fool. Oh, yes. Uh, And again, if we remember from last week, if you love us, you keep listening. And we love you more and more every episode. Do the sign up. You're getting tired. Ciao.